All right, now Genesis chapter number 14. Of course, we saw in chapter 13, that was where um, Abram and Lot split up a little bit, and, you know, and, and Abram lets Lot take whatever land he wants to go towards. And in chapter 13, he's pitching his tent towards Sodom. The next thing you know here, we see him in Sodom. He dwelled in Sodom. He gets taken captive. But what we see here, the first, essentially the first half of chapter 14, it's describing this battle. It's describing this war. Um, four kings against five kings. And, you know, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and all of that region had five kings and they were battling against the kings of Kedorlaomer and, and three other kings. And look at verse number one. We'll start reading here real briefly. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elaser, Kedorlaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemeber king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. So it says, verse 3, all these were joined together in the vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. And we get this preface of this battle. There's these five kings and their people versus these four kings. Now, why did all this happen? We see in verse number 4, 12 years they served Kedorlaomer. So Sodom, Gomorrah, and all those lands, all those people, they were servants. They were tributary unto Kedorlaomer. They were, they were under his rule. So they would be paying taxes to him and obeying him, whatever, you know, whatever he was saying they were essentially doing for 12 years. But then it says, and in the 13th year, they rebelled. So they said, nope, we've had enough of this. We're not going to do this anymore. And they rebelled against him. So, of course, with any kingdom or anything like that, you know, you're either going to have to just let them do what they're going to do or you're going to go to battle. And, of course, the king of Kedorlaomer, decides to go to battle. And this is, real, this is a really interesting story. You start reading this. Let's look at this a little bit in verse 5. And in the 14th year came Kedorlaomer and the kings that were with him. So there's three other kings with Kedorlaomer. They were all banded together. And it says, And they smote the Rephaims in Ashtaroth, Karnaim, and the Zuzims in Ham, and the Emims in Shavikirathaim, and the Horites in their Mount Seir, unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Now, pay attention to all these different people that they're, that they're conquering, that they're defeating in battle. Because none of these people are of the five kings that is going to go to war with them. So they're going through, I mean, the Rephaims, the Zuzims, it says the Horites and their Mount Seir. Um, verse number seven, and they returned and came to En Mishpat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites. So the children of Amalek they, they defeat, and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazazon Tamar. And there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, the same as Zoar, and they joined with them in the Vale of Siddim. So first they're coming, they're coming through, and they're just defeating everyone that comes in their way. I mean, they're just destroying all these people. So you figure these five kings are like, hey, let's join together, right? Let's, let's band together and, and stop these people. You know, we got five kings, and you know, they're, they're kings of, a, uh, I believe, a smaller kingdom because it's the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah. They were, they were you know, closer cities, but they, they were the rulers of their, of their particular cities. And um, these five kings get together, they join forces to fight against Kedorlaomer because they didn't want to be under his rule anymore. They, they rebelled against him, but... These four kings, they're coming through and they're just destroying. I mean, they're just, they're just mopping people up, apparently. I mean, we don't know, I don't know all the details of these wars, but it just says that they, you know, they, they defeated all these people. And then look at um, verse number 10. It says, And the vale of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountain. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. So they take their goods. Their victuals is their food. It's their supplies. You know, they take, they take all of this stuff after they defeat them in battle. And then they leave. You know, they, they spoiled them. They took all. They, they beat them in battle. They fled. They, they died in the slime pits. And, um, and they conquered them. And it says, um, so that, and then they're going back home. It says in verse 12, and they took Lot. Abram's brother's son, 
who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. So it makes a special mention to say, you know, they, they took people captive, they took these goods, they took this food, they took everything else. Oh, and they also took Lot and his goods and his stuff. He was included in that whole group of people. And um, obviously the reason why that's important is because that's Abraham's nephew. And we see Abram goes after these people. Look at verse number 13. It says, And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Aner, and these were confederate with Abram. And we see here right off the bat, you know, Abram was a good, he was a, he's a great leader, and we're going to see this in just a few minutes. But he makes, he's friends with his neighbors, right? He's, he's friends with, with Ma, um, the Amorites and um, the brother of Eshcol and the brother of Aner. You know, these people that are around him, they're confederate with Abram. You know, they're, they're, they're joined together. They're banded together, so to speak, because um, he's made friends with them. And it says in verse 14, so this guy escaped, or, you know, before that, it says this guy escapes and tells Abram, hey, you know, these kings came, Kedorlaomer Omer came, and he took Lot, like, like your, your nephew's gone. He, they they cap, captured him and took all of his stuff, and, you know, everybody, they took everybody's stuff, and, um, and they, fled, they left with him. And verse 14 says, and when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, I want to point out real quick, it says here that his brother. Um, when you're reading the Bible, you'll see some terms like this. We saw in verse 12, and they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, very specifically saying it's his nephew, right? His brother's son is his nephew. And we see, saw that earlier in Genesis. But when it's saying his brother here, it's, his, it's, it's another word, brethren or brother in the Bible is often used as just someone who's of kin with you. You know, I mean, it could be a cousin, it could be your nephew, it could be something else. It's a loose term there, brother. It's obviously not his real fleshly brother as in the same parents. You know, it's, it's defined well early. But I want to point out, it's not a mistake. It's just the, the usage of the word brother. Like, hey, brother, you know, I mean, often, even today, you know, we call each other brother and sister in the church because if you're saved, you're born again. We are brothers and sisters. But I mean, you know, oftentimes you, you have people who are friends that aren't even related at all. And they'll be like, you know, yeah, this is my brother. You know, we're brothers. But you're not really technically brothers. And that's kind of the way it is here. They use it for just a, fam uh, a family relationship, but it's not um, technically brothers. But it's, there's nothing wrong about using that word. Um, it, it's, the usage is, is common like that in the Bible. So it's, um, be aware of that so it doesn't confuse you and say, well, what's true? What's, you know, what's, is he his brother? Yeah, he's his brother in, a, in the loose sense that he's his, his kin. So it says that when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. Now, this is, to me, this is amazing because you see Abram and his 318, 318 people, 318 servants versus four kings that just defeated five kings and all of those other people along the way. I mean, this is a force to be reckoned with. Abram's got 318 people. And it gives you like the exact number. It's not even wrong. Like 318 servants and Abram. And they're going to fight this battle. Now, this is another reason why I believe Abraham was such a great leader is because he was able to get these servants that were born in his house. You know, he had people that came with him. He had all this great substance and they were his servants. They were working for him. They were doing all this stuff. But they had a lot, they had to have had a lot of respect for Abraham. They had to, you know, just for the, by virtue of the fact that they're taking on a very daunting task. They're going into, if you just looked at the odds, what you would consider to be like a suicide mission. Like just, just, oh man, how are we ever going to do this? There's 318 of us and we're going to, to rescue Lot against these four kings that just defeated everyone that came across their path. And they're not like some kingdom here. This is, this is 318 people. But also notice it says that they were trained. His trained servants born in his own house. So, you know, Abraham had them trained. They, weren't, they, were, um, they were good workers and they were trained and they were ready to battle. And it says, um, you know, they didn't desert him. Because you think about 
if, if you know if your boss or if, you know someone you worked for, even if you know if it's not someone you really trusted and had respect for and thought that they can actually do something, you'd be like, I'm not going to do that. You know, like, oh, that's a death wish. I'm, I'm going to stay here with my family. No, they had honor. They had respect unto Abraham. And Abraham was able to lead them very well to go. And, and he didn't hesitate. It says when he heard that Lot was, was taken captive, he went. I mean, he took, he's like, okay, guys, it's time to go. We got to go rescue Lot. And for now, I'll get back to that. Family is so important. And um, he, Abraham here has a great respect for his family. Now, you look at Lot. Lot's a guy that did not make very many good decisions in his life at all. I mean, he, he got disillusioned with the, with the wealth, with the money, with the wealth of the land. He chose the better part for himself and just let Abram get whatever was left over. He kind of was, was selfish in that manner. He, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. Next thing you know, he's living in Sodom among these extremely wicked men. The Bible said that even then they were, they were really wicked. And um, this, is, this is much before they even get destroyed by God um, with fire and rim, brimstone raining down from heaven. You know, he's living among these men. And you could, look at, you could look at someone like that and say, well, he made his own bed. Let him lay in it. You know, stupid lot. He should have just, you know, he shouldn't have gone there and done that in the first place. I'm just going to let him take him. You know, he's getting what he's getting. He's reaping what he's sown. And it would be very easy to have that type of an attitude here with Lot based on, you know, his, his bad choices and stuff like that. But Abram doesn't look at it like that. Abram has a lot more respect for his family. He's looking out for his nephew. He's going to look out for him and say, you know what? I'm going to go rescue him. I'm going to save him. I'm going to help him out because that's what family does. You're supposed to look out for him. The family ought to be a very tightly knit unit. I mean, you should be really close with your family. And um, even when they make mistakes, I mean, Lot made a lot of mistakes in his life, yet Abraham was still there when the rubber met the road. I mean, he was, he was there to help him out and to go in, in his time of need to be there for him. Now, of course, it, uh, Lot shouldn't have made the decision they made, but um, Abraham still fought for his family. And... Um, the only reason that he went after him was to get Lot back. He didn't care about the other Sodomites. He didn't care about getting their stuff back. He didn't say, oh, what a travesty. I can't believe that Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, got taken captive. and I'm going to go get all their goods back. It wasn't the only thing that led him to go was that his nephew was taken captive. And he was going to get him back because that's who was important to Abram. That was, that was something that he knew um, he needed. He had a duty or an obligation to go and protect him. Now, you ought to be able to rely on your family. And I get it. There's a lot of screwed up families out there today. But it doesn't, I mean, that's, the goal is still the same. The ideal is still the same. That you ought to be able to rely on your family. And they ought to be able to rely on you when help is needed. Don't be this type of person that's not, that doesn't have that, that, that strong sense of family. I mean, you ought to be there for them. And Satan is out attacking our families today. And he knows the strength and the power that, that the family actually has. God has ordained the family structure just as much as he ordained, you know, ordained his government structure. And you know, he's ordained these authorities in our life. And he ordained the church structure. These are three very, very important roles in our life that God has ordained. And the family structure is important. And we ought to be looking out for our families and be there for them. Now, Satan has been attacking our families in many ways. He's trying to, to just destroy the family and weaken that strength. Because when people have a good family, and you find, I mean, you'll do a lot for your family member that you won't do. You'll do. You should be able to do things for your family like way more than anyone else. Like you'll do a lot more things and put yourself in a lot more danger and, and, and put yourself out there a lot more, take on a lot more risk for your family than you would for just pe some strangers, people that you don't know. And Satan knows it and, that, and there's power to that. Into knowing that, hey, we're going we're gonna to stick together here. We're going to have each other's backs. We're going you know, to make sure that our family is taken care of. So what does Satan try to do? He tries to destroy that. Now, when you grow up in a family... And you have brothers and sisters and, and, a, and, a, and a, a mom and a dad that are all that are together. They're married. They're joined together. You have a complete family, right? Um, 
There's a lot of strength to that. So Satan wants to, to chip away at that, you know, a symbol, you know, you call it a rock, if you will. Everyone's joined together and, and, and cares about each other, loves each other, and, and will do anything for their family, right? And when you have something that's solid, hey, when attack comes on one of them, now you've got to mess with everybody. And that's where you get a lot of that strength from in your family. Say, hey, you're not in this by yourself. You're not alone. There's strength in that. There's comfort in that. Lot wasn't alone. He had Abram to come and help to rescue him out of his time of trouble because he was a good family member. But Satan's looking to attack that. He wants to crumble that. He wants to separate that. He wants the children to learn rebellion. He wants them to learn to, to not listen to their parents, to disobey him, and to go off and do their own thing. And um, he's, try he's trying to split up the family. He's, he's that's why we have so much adultery and fornication that's being crammed down our throats through the media and through the, the television and movies because when a, when a husband and wife start to have problems and if you know families get broken up, as we have so many broken homes where the, the, the husband and the wife get divorced, the strength of that family when the, when the parents get divorced is just crumbled. I mean, it's split in half. Now, all of a sudden, you know, you're separated them and the kids are kind of stuck in the middle and it's a lot easier for them to, the attacks to come in at the children because they don't, it's not as tightly knit with mom and dad both joined together and both looking out for the children. Now you've got one looking out for their needs and the kids and, you know, and just, it's just completely separate. You're not, you're not getting um, the maximum strength out of that family. And that's why we have, all, I mean, the, the entire, the, the, Family is under attack from all points completely. I mean, trying to get, um, you know, you think about the feminist movement. And we were just talking about this out soul winning, but the, the culture has changed so much in our society of this teaching women that they need to be independent, they need to be able to rely on themselves. They need to, you know, be able to get a job. They, they get 50% of the say in all decisions that are made in the family. Like all of these things are wicked and they're evil and they're against God's plan. God designed men and women differently to have different roles and different functions. And when you have this, this feminine movement, it actually causes more conflict and strife and gets the family out of order more than anything. Because now, let's just take, for example, the 50-50 the thing, right? You have a decision to make. Well, what the wife has to say is exactly, has a, carries the same exact weight as what the husband has to say. And when you disagree, well, now you've just got to fight. Now you just have contention and someone's just going to have to give in ultimately, but if nobody gives in, you're just going to have a bunch of fighting. As opposed to the way that God ordained it, no, the husband is the one that God chose and said, that's the one that makes the decisions. So now you can eliminate a lot of that fighting if you just say, well, I'm in charge and this is the decision that I'm making. And that's the way it should be for the husband. It should eliminate a lot of fights, a lot of arguments. Um, how about the women being taught to just be independent and to, and to provide for themselves? Well, according to the Bible, that's not the way it is. According to the Bible, the daughters are dependent on their fathers all throughout their life, and they leave their father and mother when they cleave unto their husband, when they, when they go and marry another man, and then it's the husband's job to provide for that, for that woman. And women in the Bible, their roles should always be provided for. They should be provided for either by their father, when they get to the age, if they marry, when they marry, then they get provided for by the other, by their husband. And that's the way it's supposed to be. They, they should be, and they should be taught to be relying on their father and their, their husband to take care of them because they have a different job. Their job is not to be focused on making the money. Their job is not to be focused on all of these other things because there's too many things in life to be able to do it all. And if you're going to have a strong family, you need to have a man going out and making the income and providing for the family and working hard at that to make sure all the needs are met in that realm while the, the woman is at home and taking care of everything at home because the husband's gone to work and making sure that everything is under control and being run 
appropriately at home and with the children, that they're being raised properly and everything else. But now, I mean, again, the attacks on the family. They want to, to, to get this mindset in women that, no, you have to work too. So now you're going to have husband and wife both out at work. And when they're both working, now what about the children? Well, the children have to go somewhere. So now you have to send them off to somebody else to get raised, whether it's you know public education, they're, they're out for eight hours a day with someone else teaching them and training them and telling them what's right and what's wrong, someone other than the mother and father for, for such an extended period of time. And then, or just like sitting in daycare or whatever else, someone else is, is taking care of that person. You know, and these bonds form with other people. And you don't know, you never know what someone else is going to teach your child anyways when, when you just let them go and you just let them go off unattended by a parent, by someone who is truly loving and invested in that child. You don't know what someone else is going to do. You don't know what someone else is going to teach. You don't know how liberal a teacher might be and the things that they're going to try to program into your child's brain when they're there for eight hours a day, five days a week. That's a lot of time to be spent. I mean, if it's seven hours a day, whatever, how long kids go to school these days, that's a long time to be away and, and to, to just get this to, and just to be separated and to be comfortable from a young age of just being completely separated from your family. Like that's normal. When I believe it's normal to have a tight-knit family. You should be looking out for your family. You should look out for your relatives and, um, and looking out for their well-being. Now, um, All of these attacks that are happening, I mean, even if the kid's going off to college, they're being taught to wait for marriage, live with your girlfriend, your boyfriend for a while, make sure everything's going to work before you even make a commitment and get married. And all this other, all this world's nonsense is, is, is ridiculous. And that type of, of thinking and that, and that type of philosophy leads to all the children being born out of wedlock today. Because there is no respect for marriage. The kids are told to go out and do these things and they're just leaving father and mother where they, and, and going out and fornicating because now they have no, um, no, one, um, no accountability. No one there to, to kind of help keep them in check and say, you know, what are you doing? Who is this? They're not sleeping here in your bed tonight. When you're off by yourself, all kinds of things can happen. And we literally are living in a bastardized society because there's so many bastards that are born today because there's these children that are born out of wedlock and they don't have a father. Because all the fornication that's going on, now they're just growing up and they're, they're growing up in a single, a single parent home. And there is no strength there. And, and the, the, the family is just being destroyed. All of these things are, are designed to break up that family. Now think about this. What would you do if your family member was taken captive? And, and put yourself in that shoes. You ought to be able to have that, that type of a response like Abram had. Now even, you know, this is his nephew. He made all kinds of dumb choices. He got himself into trouble. But that's what your family's for is to help get you out of that trouble. Now, I admit, sometimes there's times where, you, you know, it's good to learn a lesson, but I mean, he was taken captive, right? I mean, this guy, he was, he was taken captive, and that's pretty serious. This isn't just like, okay, he's going to, um, you know, he got in a fight, and he got beat up, whatever, he's fine now. This is something that, that, you know, he got taken captive. And this is really interesting time, timing to be preaching on this chapter with Abraham going after his, his family, because... If you're familiar with the, the Kent Hovind case, we were just talking about this during our announcements and you know we ought to be praying for him and, and praying that he gets out. He has been taken captive. He has been taken captive by the thug IRS, by the government that, that literally they just want to shut him up. They want to silence him because he's been very effective at, at uh, preaching the truth. And, and you know preaching the truth about, about how evolution's a lie and creationism true, and all this other stuff, and they they uh, they don't like that, so they came after him. And um, even regardless of what you think about all the charges against him, the the phony structuring charges, and everything else that they brought against him, regardless of that, if you're his family, 
You ought to be doing everything in your power to release him from that captivity, just like Abram did. He took, you say, well, I don't even have that many people. You know, Abram had, had 318 servants against these four kings that just destroyed everybody else. But I'm going to go after him anyways. Because it's a righteous cause. And for trying to free Ken open, you would think that at the very least, his family should be trying to get him out. Now, I'm not going to speak for his entire family. I don't know everything that they're doing, but I do know this. I, one of his sons, Eric, has the capabilities of getting a lot of attention brought to this matter because he's kind of been, has taken over and been running the show since Kent's got put into jail and has been running his ministries and you know doing the cre creation stuff and going around and evangelizing and doing all this stuff and kind of trying to carry the torch of his father, yet you hear nothing about his case. You hear nothing about him trying to garner support. You hear nothing about him railing against the government or trying to get him free or trying to do anything to set his, his father free from this captivity. And it's a shame on him for not using his voice, for not using his position and, and using whatever means he can basically to, to free his dad from captivity. Because oftentimes, especially in this day and age with our media, you get enough media spotlight on something. You see the wicked people of this world, they don't want that spotlight shined right on them. They'll run away, they'll scurry away. And that is still a little bit of power that we have left to be able to, to, to free people who are, you know, um, murder or, or not murder free people who are um imprisoned falsely that are that have done righteous things and they've just um they've been um persecuted when you can get enough people enough attention enough focus on it enough people on your side to to really make a big stir about it or a big controversy over it you'll see some changes made you can you can actually get some results from that and Eric Hoven is someone who's in the position to bring a lot more light to this, to garner a lot more support, to try to get some adequate legal representation for, for Ken so that he can just get out of there and to just bring a lot more attention to the subject, yet he's done virtually nothing. And to the in some cases, he's done like, he's been more harmful. And um, there's a lot of information out there on, on, the, on being real specific about that. But um, it's a shame and, you know, he ought to be doing a lot more. And if you have a family member, you know, that goes through a hard time like this or is taken captive, you ought to be able to take it on yourself to go and help that family member out. And, um, you know, that's the reason why Abram went and did what he did. Now, you, you might say, well, how did Abram even win that battle? How is that even possible? And the only reason why, it's not just because they were the most awesome fighters in the whole world at that time and that they were able to just completely outskill all of those people. It's because God was with them. And we see that um, here at the end of the chapter. It says in verse 20, it says, And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And... Um, of course, all of the credit goes unto God because God is the one that could make something like this happen. Turn, if you would, to Leviticus chapter 26 and we'll see something real briefly in Leviticus 26 about, um, you know, when basically, you know, if God be for us, who could be against us, right? When God is on your side, you already have the majority. You already have the odds in your favor. When God's on your side, it's just, it's... Everything stacked against your enemy, even if it, uh, all appearances make it look like it's the other way around. Look at Leviticus 26, verse 3. The Bible says, If ye walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them. Now, this is talking about, this is, think about Abram. Because Abram was doing this. Abr God called Abram out of his land, and Abram went out of his land. Now, he delayed a little bit, but we're at the point we're at now. Abram's following God. God tells him in, you know, in chapter 13, he's saying, look all around, all this land, I'm going to give it to you. God's blessing him. Abram's doing the right thing. We see him you know, have the humble attitude. We see him serving God. And um, he's walking in his statutes. So Leviticus 26.3, If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season. And the land shall yield or increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. 
and your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time, and ye shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell, excuse me, dwell in your land safely. Abram was, was, we could see all of these things in Abram's life. He was doing what was right. He had a lot of substance. God had blessed him. God had blessed the fruit of the ground. God had blessed his cattle and all these things. And he was dwelling safely. Now Lot wasn't doing that which was right. Lot wasn't living safely. Obviously, because he got taken captive. But keep reading here. Look at verse number 6. He says, And I will give peace in the land, and ye shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the sword go through your land. And ye shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. And five of you shall chase an hundred, and an hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. And your enemies shall fall before you by the sword, for I will have respect unto you, and make you fruitful, and multiply you, and establish my covenant with you. And this is what we see. This is why Abram was able to defeat them and able to get Lot back and get all their goods back and be able to defeat those armies is because he was righteous. He was doing what was right. God was fighting for him. So you can take a hundred and put 10,000 to flight. And he had 300. So he's able to put 300,000 people to flight, you know, according to this verse, because God was with him. And obviously, you know, you could put even more to flight than that when God's with him. But he's just showing this, this immense difference in numbers, right? Like you've got five people. You could chase a hundred people away just with five. You got 100 people, you take, chase 10,000 because God is with you. And that is the key to Abraham's success is that God was with him, God was blessing him, and, that, and, and Abraham was, was a righteous man. He was doing that which was right in the sight of God. And notice too, he was, I mean, he was still pretty smart. He went against them at night. And at nighttime, I'm sure they had no idea how many people were actually there. You think of um, Gideon. When Gideon came to battle, and there was the 300 men with him, and all they had was their, um, the light and their trumpets. And when they smashed the, the vessels that were over their lights, they, you know, they, they kind of snuck up on the enemy. They did a surprise attack. They smashed the lights. All of a sudden, they, you know, the enemy looks around. There's all these lights, and they're blowing with the trumpet. And that scared them enough to just to run off and kill each other. And, you know, and they, they won the victory um, just with those few people it, because God was with them, though, because God uh, fought for them. And we see the same thing here with Abraham and his 318 servants that were trained in his house. Let's keep reading here. Um, verse 15 says, and he divided himself against them. And so he, he split up his, his, his army, right? 318 people. He splits them up, he and his servants, by night and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. So he's just, I mean, he's just going in and going after them and just keeps on pursuing after them. Verse 16, and he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. So he frees all the captives. He brings them all back. He brings back the this, this spoil, the things that were stolen from them and gets all of that stuff back from these kings that had just got finished in their whole um, successful campaign against all these different people. Verse 17, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Keterleomer. And the king, and look, it says the slaughter of Keterleomer. I mean, they slaughtered him. It wasn't even a battle. It wasn't like, like it was close by enemies. They just went and slaughtered um, Keterleomer and the kings that were with him at the valley of Shavi, which is in the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Now, I'm not going to go too far in depth with Melchizedek. I just preached an entire sermon about um, the order of Melchizedek. But I think there's a point here that I don't think I mentioned in that sermon that I, I should have. I just I didn't um, I didn't get around to it. Of course, Melchizedek. In case you missed that sermon, Melchizedek here, I believe, is a, is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. He's the servant of the Most High God, and I'm not going to go through and prove all that. I just pre preach entire sermon proving that, but. Um, it says here, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine 
and he was the priest of the Most High God. So I think it's interesting, you know, you think of what we do um, in the New Testament, we hold communion. And communion, you, you eat the unleavened bread and you drink the, the unfermented uh, wine in observance of Jesus Christ shedding, you know, having his body broken and his blood shed for us. And that was very symbolic. And I think it's only appropriate here that it tells us that Melchizedek brought forth bread and wine. And again, just, just more evidence showing this is Jesus Christ bringing forth the bread and wine, bringing forth his body and his blood um, symbolically. But let's keep reading here. Verse number 19, And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. So Melchizedek saying, you know, God's the one that delivered your enemies into your hand, and he gave him tithes of all. So Abram, after, this, after he brings the spoil back, he gives tithes unto Melchizedek. And um, it says in, in verse 21, And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. Now, what we see here is that um, the king of Sodom is, a, you know, is, is representing Satan in this passage. And, you know, the, Sodom was a wicked place. And we see the king here. Um, this is exactly how, how Satan operates. He says, give me the persons and take the goods to yourself. He's saying, I want the people. Because he knows there's a value in the people. He's saying, yeah, Abram, here, you can, you can take all the stuff, but I want the people. And um, this is exactly what Satan wants. Satan doesn't care about the riches of this world. He knows that the riches are vain. Now, they're under his control, but he wants people to worship him. He wants the souls of men. He wants those people to, because he wants to be like the Most High God. He wants people to belong to him. You remember when uh, Satan tempted Christ in the wilderness. He offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. He offered him these riches and this power and everything else that he had to offer. And um, all he asked in return was that he bowed down and worship him. Because Satan cared about the person, not about that other stuff. He cared about having um, you know, Jesus worship him. Now, I believe that Satan makes that deal available even with people to this day. You hear it oftentimes, and it's and it's it's eerie, it's scary when you when you look into it. And, and there's documentaries that have been done, and I've read up on this personally because uh, just my my personal interest in the different rock bands and stuff like that, and reading some biographies and and reading it more in depth about some of these these groups. And um, there are lots of stories or lots of interviews where people have admitted that they basically made a pact with the devil, that they sold their soul, you know, sold their soul for rock and roll. I mean, it's even on album titles. Like, like it's, it's, it, it's obvious. And people just want to overlook it and say, oh yeah, they're just kind of tongue in cheek or they're just, you know, they're just saying these things. It's not really the truth. But no, it really is. I mean, these people are making these songs, you know, um, the crossroads. I went down to the crossroads and they're like, there, there's these stories of people who get these great abilities to make this music and stuff. And I believe it's because they are selling their souls to Satan. Or they're making a deal with them. Because Satan cares about those souls, about having them to himself. Yeah, I'll give you riches. I'll give you goods. I'll give you all the vanity of this life. And then these people realize later on in life that they made a stupid deal. They made a, they made a dumb deal because they lost their soul. And what will give, what man give in exchange for his soul? They made a, they made a bad deal. By Satan, he was able to do it to, with Christ to offer him all the fame and riches and power. What's changed? I believe he still makes that promise today. And, and people have admitted to that. And you, you don't believe me? Look it up for yourself. There's, there are plenty of people out there that have admitted that. And... Um, it's crazy, but he offers that deceitfulness of riches in exchange for people's souls. He hunts for the souls of men, and he's willing to give up all the riches for it. And we see that here in this statement that the king of Sodom made unto Abraham. He's like, you know, take, take the goods for yourself, but give me the people. That's what I want is the people. But, um, of course, Abram refuses. Look at verse number 
22, And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich. So Abram saying, look, I'm not going to accept anything from you, you wicked king. I'm not taking any of your stuff because I don't want you saying, oh yeah, the only reason why Abram has all these goods is because I gave it to, you know, like he got that from me. No, Abram wants to make sure that God gets all of the credit, that everything that happened in, God's, in, in Abram's life was because of God's blessing on him. And, and that's what... Um, that's what he doesn't, he doesn't want anyone else saying, I did that for them. No, God gave everything unto Abram and no one else can make that claim or get that credit. He's like, I'm not even going to take a thread or a shoe latch. He's like, I'm not taking any of it. The only, the only exception he makes here is, um, he says in verse, verse 24, the last verse of the chapter, save only that which the young men have eaten and the portion of the men which went with me Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. He's saying, okay, you want to give some stuff away? Give it to these guys that came and helped me. Remember, the, the people that were confederate with him went with him. So the people of, uh, of, with Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre, those, those people that, that he was confederate with, they, um, they went with him and helped him out. And he's like, you let them, you know, let them take their due, let them take the, you know, their, um, what you're giving them, but I'm not taking anything. And I think another part of it is just because, you know, he didn't do it for the king of Sodom. He didn't do it for the people of Sodom. He did it for Lot. That was his purpose. That was his goal, was to, was to, was to protect his nephew. Because Abram was a, was a virtuous man. He was a man of integrity. He was a man of honesty. He was a godly, righteous man. And he knew the importance of family. And Lot had no one else. I mean, Lot lost, you know, his father was dead. It was basically like Abram's son because Abram had took him under his wing and, and was taking care of him um, when, after his father had died. So it was like another son to him. And that's the way he felt for him. And, you know, I would go to the ends of the earth if my, if my children were ever kidnapped or taken captive. I would go and do anything to get them back. And you better believe that. And there's that, that type of determination is just what I was trying to get across of, of family. And when you have that strong family, we need to protect our families today. We need to make sure that, that because there are going to be lots of attacks. There are going to be attacks on your marriage. There are going to be attacks coming to your children. We need to be on guard. We need to make sure that our marriage is sound that we're doing the right thing in God's eyes, that, that you know, no one's going to try to stick a wedge in between husband and wife. No one's going to try to stick a wedge between the children and their parents. We ought to have good relationships and value the family that you have. And, um, and don't let anything destroy that family because the family is powerful. And, and Satan knows that. And he's going to try to destroy your family. But let's not let that happen. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. Um, it's great to read these stories about Abram and, um, and his integrity and, and, Lord, how much he loved you and served you and was an upright man and also how much he cared for his family and was willing to put himself at risk to go out and, and rescue his family, even though they may have made mistakes and done some stupid things, dear God, he still was looking out for them. And we know as a loving father that you do look out for us, dear God, that you don't just forsake us, that we're your children and that, yes, sometimes you might be angry with us because we do the wrong things and we deserve punishments, dear God, but we know that you're not just going to forsake us and, um, and punish us over, over that which is right or just, dear God, and that we can always turn to you for help and look to you for help. Help us to be the type of people that other people can look to, that other family members can look to for support, and that we will be willing to, um, to help them out in their times of need, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.